Book One, Part One of Ovid's Metamorphoses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ligny. Metamorphoses by Publius Ovidius Naso. Translated by Brooks Moore. Book One, Part One. My soul is wrought to sing of forms transformed to bodies new and strange. Immortal gods, inspire my heart, for ye have changed yourselves, and all things you have changed. O lead my song in smooth and measured strains, from olden days when earth began to this completed time. Before the ocean and the earth appeared, before the skies had overspread them all, the face of nature in a vast expanse was not but chaos uniformly waste. It was a rude and undeveloped mass that nothing made except a ponderous weight, and all discordant elements confused were there congested in a shapeless heap. As yet the sun afforded earth no light, nor did the moon renew her crescent horns. The earth was not suspended in the air, exactly balanced by her heavy weight. Not far along the margin of the shores had Amphitrite stretched her lengthened arms, for all the land was mixed with sea and air. The land was soft, the sea unfit to sail, the atmosphere opaque, to naught was given a proper form, and everything was strife, and all was mingled in a seething mass, with hot the cold part strove, and wet with dry, and soft with hard, and weight with empty void. But God, or kindly nature, ended strife. He cut the land from skies, the sea from land, the heavens ethereal from material air. And when were all evolved from that dark mass, he bound the fractious parts in tranquil peace. The fiery element of convex heaven leaped from the mass devoid of dragging weight, and chose the summit arch, to which the air, as next in quality, was next in place. The earth, more dense, attracted grosser parts, and moved by gravity sank underneath, and last of all, the wide surrounding waves in deeper channels rolled around the globe. And when this god, which one is yet unknown, had carved asunder that discordant mass, had thus reduced it to its elements, that every part should equally combine. When time began, he rounded out the earth, and moulded it to form a mighty globe. Then poured he forth the deeps, and gave command that they should billow in the rapid winds, that they should compass every shore of earth. He also added fountains, pools, and lakes, and bound with shelving banks the slanting streams, which partly are absorbed and partly join the boundless ocean. Thus received amid the wide expanse of uncontrolled waves, they beat the shores instead of crooked banks. At his command, the boundless plains extend, the valleys are depressed, the woods are clothed in green, the stony mountains rise, and as the heavens are intersected on the right by two broad zones, by two that cut the left, and by a fifth consumed with ardent heat, with such a number did the careful God mark off the compassed weight, and thus the earth received as many climes. Such heat consumes the middle zone, that none may dwell therein, and two extremes are covered with deep snow, and two are placed betwixt the hot and cold, which mixed together give a temperate clime and over all the atmosphere suspends with weight proportioned to the fiery sky, exactly as the weight of earth compares with weight of water. And he ordered mist to gather in the air and spread the clouds. He fixed the thunders that disturb our souls, and brought the lightning on destructive winds that also waft the cold. Nor did the great artificer permit these mighty winds to blow unbounded in the pathless skies, 
but each discordant brother fixed in space, although his power can scarce restrain the rage to rend the universe. At his command, to far Aurora, Eris took his way, to Naboth, Persia, and that mountain range first gilded by the dawn, and Zephyr's flight was towards the evening star and peaceful shores, warm with the setting sun. And Boreas invaded Scythia and the northern snows, and Oster wafted to the distant south, where clouds and rain encompass his abode. And over these he fixed the liquid sky, the void of weight, and free from earthly dross. And scarcely had he separated these, and fixed their certain bounds, when all the stars, which long were pressed and hidden in the mass, began to gleam out from the plains of heaven, and traversed with the gods bright either fields, and lest some part might be bereft of life, the gleaming waves were filled with twinkling fish, the earth was covered with wild animals, the agitated air was filled with birds. But one, more perfect and more sanctified, a being capable of lofty thought, intelligent to rule, was wanting still. Man was created. Did the unknown God, designing then a better world, make man of seed divine? Or did Prometheus take the new soil of earth, that still contained some godly element of heaven's life, and use it to create the race of men, first mingling it with water of new streams, so that his new creation, upright men, was made in image of commanding gods? On earth the brute creation bends its gaze, but man was given a lofty countenance, and was commanded to behold the skies, and with an upright face may view the stars. And so it was, that shapeless clay put on the form of men, till then unknown to earth. First was the golden age, then rectitude spontaneous in the heart prevailed, and faith. Avengers were not seen, for laws unframed were all unknown and needless. Punishment and fear of penalties existed not. No harsh decrees were fixed on brazen plates. No suppliant multitude the countenance of justice feared, averting, for they dwelt without a judge in peace. Descended not the steeps, shorn from its height, the lofty pine, cleaving the trackless waves of alien shores, nor distant realms were known to wandering men. The towns were not entrenched for time of war. They had no brazen trumpets, straight, nor horns of curving brass, nor helmets, shields, nor swords. There was no thought of martial pomp. Secure, a happy multitude enjoyed repose. Then, of her own accord, the earth produced a store of every fruit. The harrow touched her not, nor did the plowshare wound her fields. And men content with given food, and none compelling, gathered arbut fruits and wild strawberries on the mountain sides, and ripe blackberries clinging to the bush, and corners and sweet acorns on the ground, downfallen from the spreading tree of Jove. Eternal spring, soft breathing zephyrs soothed and warmly cherished buds and blooms, produced without a seed. The valleys, though unploughed, gave many fruits. The fields, though not renewed, white glistened with the heavy bearded wheat. Rivers flowed milk and nectar, and the trees, the very oak trees, then gave honey of themselves. When Saturn had been banished into night, and all the world was ruled by Jove supreme, the silver age, though not so good as gold, but still surpassing yellow brass, prevailed. Jove first reduced to ears the primal spring, by him divided into periods four, unequal, summer, autumn, winter, spring, then glowed with tawny heat the parched air, or pendant icicles in winter froze, and man stopped crouching in crude caverns, while he built his homes of tree rods, bark and twined. Then were the cereals planted in long rows, and bullocks groaned beneath the heavy yoke. The third age followed, called the Age of Bronze, when cruel people were inclined to arms, but not to impious crimes, 
and last of all the ruthless and hard age of iron prevailed, from which malignant vein great evil sprung, and modesty and faith and truth took flight, and in their steed deceits and snares and frauds and violence and wicked love of gain succeeded. Then the sailor spread his sails to winds unknown, and keels that long had stood on lofty mountains pierced uncharted waves. Surveyors anxious marked with meats and bounds the lands, created free as light and air. Nor need the rich ground furnish only crops, and give due nourishment by right required. They penetrated to the bowels of earth, and dug up wealth, bad cause of all our ills. Rich ores, which long ago the earth had hid, and deep removed to gloomy Stygian caves. And soon destructive iron and harmful gold were brought to light. And war, which uses both, came forth, and shook with sanguinary grip his clashing arms. Rapacity broke forth. The guest was not protected from his host, the father-in-law from his own son-in-law. Even brothers seldom could abide in peace. The husband threatened to destroy his wife, and she her husband. Horrid stab dames mixed the deadly henbane. Eager sons inquire their father's ages. Piety was slain, and last of all, the virgin deity, Astria, vanished from the blood-stained earth. And lest ethereal heights should long remain less troubled than the earth, the throne of heaven was threatened by the giants, and they piled mountain on mountain to the lofty stars. But Jove, omnipotent, shot thunderbolts through Mount Olympus, and he overturned from Osa huge, enormous Pelion. And while these dreadful bodies lay overwhelmed in their tremendous bulk, so fame reports, the earth was reeking with the copious blood of her gigantic sons, and thus, replete with moisture, she infused the steaming gore with life renewed. So that a monument of such ferocious stock should be retained, she made that offspring in the shape of men. But this new race alike despised the gods, and by the greed of savage slaughter proved a sanguinary birth when, from his throne supreme, the son of Saturn viewed their deeds, he deeply groaned, and calling to his mind the loathsome feast Lycaon had prepared, a recent deed not common to report, his soul conceived great anger, worthy Jove, and he convened a council, no delay detained the chosen gods. When skies are clear, a path is well defined on high, which men, because so white, have named the Milky Way. It makes a passage for the deities, and leads to mentions of the Thunder God, to Jove's imperial home. On either side of its wide way the noble gods are seen. Inferior gods in other parts abide, but there the potent and renowned of heaven have fixed their homes. It is a glorious place, our most audacious verse might designate the Palace of High Heaven. When the gods were seated, therefore, in its marble halls, the king of all above the throne sat high, and leaning on his ivory sceptre, thrice and once again he shook his awful locks, wherewith he moved the earth and seas and stars, and thus indignantly began to speak. The time when serpent-footed giants strove to fix their hundred arms on captive heaven, not more than this event could cause alarm, for my dominion of the universe. Although it was a savage enemy, yet warred we with a single source derived of one. Now must I utterly destroy this mortal race, wherever Nereus roars around the world. Yea, by the infernal streams that glide through Stygian groves beneath the world, I swear it. Every method has been tried. The knife must cut immedicable wounds, lest maladies infect untainted parts. Beneath my sway are demigods and fauns, nymphs, rustic deities, sylvans of the hills, satires. All these unworthy heaven's abodes we should at least permit to dwell on earth which we to them bequeathed. What think ye, gods? Is safety theirs when I, your sovereign lord, the thunderbolt controller, 
am ensnared by fiercely Khan? Ardent in their wrath, the astonished gods demand revenge overtake this miscreant, he who dared commit such crimes. T'was even thus, when raged that impious band to blot the Roman name in sacred blood of Caesar, sudden apprehensive fears of ruin absolute astonished men, and all the world convulsed. Nor is the love thy people bear to thee, Augustus, less than these display to Jupiter, whose voice and gesture all the murmuring hosts restrain. And as indignant clamor ceased, suppressed by regnant majesty, Jove once again broke the deep silence with imperial words. Dismiss your cares, he paid the penalty. However, all the crime and punishment now learn from this. An infamous report of this unholy age had reached my ears, and wishing it were false, I sloped my course from high Olympus, and although a god, disguised in human form, I view the world. It would delay us to recount the crimes unnumbered, for reports were less than truth. I traversed Menelaus, where fearful dens abound, over Lycaeus, wintry slopes of pine-tree groves, across Silenus steep, and as the twilight warned of night's approach, I stopped in that Arcadian tyrant's realms, and entered his inhospitable home. And when I showed his people that a god had come, the lowly prayed and worshipped me, but this Lycan mocked their pious vows, and scoffing said, A fair experiment will prove the truth, if this be god or man. And he prepared to slay me in the night, to end my slumbers in the sleep of death. So made he merry with his impious proof, but not content with this, he cut the throat of a Molossian hostage sent to him, and partly softened his still quivering limbs in boiling water, partly roasted them on fires that burned beneath. And when this flesh was served to me on tables, I destroyed his dwelling and his worthless household gods with thunderbolts avenging. Terror struck, he took to flight, and on the silent plains is howling in his vain attempts to speak. He raves and rages in his greedy jaws, desiring their accustomed slaughter turn against the sheep, still eager for their blood. His vesture separates in shaggy hair, his arms are chains to legs, and as a wolf he has the same gray locks, the same hard face, the same bright eyes, the same ferocious look. Thus fell one house, but not one house alone deserved to perish. Over all the earth ferocious deeds prevail. All men conspire in evil. Let them therefore feel the weight of dreadful penalty so justly earned, for such hath my unchanging will ordained. With exclamation some approved the words of Jove, and added fuel to his wrath, while others gave assent but all deplored and questioned the estate of earth deprived of mortals. Who could offer frankincense upon the altars? Would he suffer earth to be despoiled by hungry beasts of prey? Such idle questions of the state of men the king of gods forbade, but granted soon to people earth with race miraculous unlike the first. End of Book One, Part One